Yes. Um, first off, I just want to mention that I hope you'll take some time to look at our displays. Lynn has collected hats from 18, I think 1860 to 1960 or 1849. I see some I'm yeah. aware now. <laughs> I know. And uh, we've got those around. And then because it's our 10 year anniversary uh, for historic homes, we started in 2008 handing them out. We, have, we handed out 10 the first year. And so we put those first houses up here. Mm -hmm. And um, the rest of them are in a book. Mm -hmm. uh, someplace. <laughs> I'll get it out for you, but okay. if you want to see it. But the, over here, I want to make a special mention of this house over here on Whiting Road. This house, yes, was, Wendy Marsh owned it at the time, and uh, we gave it a plaque, and it's since been torn down. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no. Somebody didn't appreciate history. <laughs> so you can you can understand appreciate history because once it's gone, it's gone. What did they build there instead? Oh, they had a beautiful houses. Oh, okay. You know. At least it wasn't the county. Right. But on the other hand, <laughs> some of those houses look like Mechadeed houses anyway. Um, okay, so then the other announcement is that we um, will be having our barn sale in June at my house, which is this house. And, the, and you're welcome to bring your stuff into the barn in the back. And the doors are open, and I put some receipts there so you can get, grab a receipt and just put. We don't use, we don't take anything really large because we can't lift it, <laughs> or complicated. <laughs> like, uh, let's see. Like the computer stuff, yeah. yeah. So, um, but everything else we take. And we have a note room. We have three, two barns that you can go into, and then a carriage house, and then we'll have tents outside. So one of the, the interesting things here today is that we have a attic committee. And they're, because our attic was getting so filled up, Harvey knows, with everything. And there was no room to put anything. And not all of it was taken in. So the attic committee has gone up. Their beginning part was to photograph all of the chairs we had up there. And now the board itself has deaccessioned so many. I think it's 24, right, Deb? Mm -hmm. Deb is here. Mm -hmm. Deb Oakley is in charge of it. Her, her pal, Carol's on the other side. Mm -hmm. But they've been working diligently on it. But one of the things you see, She's sitting on one of these chairs. These chairs, you guys could take them home if you want one. They're right here. Yes, it's a library chair, but the library doesn't want them. What's your library? I don't know. The school library. I think the school library. Oh, I have to have one. Oh. Harvey, you need one too. I don't need one. Well, I will take one. Because it was a school library that I went to. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Probably. I'm thinking. Wow. Most I'll, of our donations. I'll take it. Nancy, would you like to have a, a chair? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, your husband collects antiques. <laughs> yeah, then we have other chairs also that no, are more I, I, I think I'd that like you would put in your these. house. But okay. these are nice and comfortable, right? Yes. yes they are very comfortable. Okay. Except doesn't have any pants. It looks like that one. Well, you don't have padding. This can't padding either. It looks no. like a pad. Go buy a pad. Go buy a pad. I have a padded, you know what. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Me too. Uh, okay, so June 13, 14, and 15 mm -hmm. is the barn? Yeah, is a barn sale. Okay. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So, um,. We hope you come, and if yeah. you want to donate stuff, just bring it in. Okay. Bring it on down. It supports the museum, and um, that's one of our biggest fundraisers, right, for, this, okay. for the year. Yeah, so it helps us Good. a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And today, because Mary Pantis is so special. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we have the candy kitchen right here, yep. and, and Esther Dunn didn't put it in her book. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
And she used to come in there all the yeah, time. I don't know why. And I used to substitute teach for her when she was oh, out. <laughs> and I had her for a teacher also. And so I think, did you have this done yet? Yeah. Okay. Did you? No, Harry was not here then. Harvey, were you? Did no. you have her? No, no he was. He, Esther was Dunn. he didn't come out till his freshman year. Oh, because he's from West Webster. No, Ronnie Oh, you're in Ronnie Oh, okay. So on with the show. Mary Pantis is going to get give us all the information we need, so we can document it and have it in art history. So thank you. Well, I've been invited to speak about my favorite topic, which is the Webster Candy Kitchen. <laughs> and just for your, your uh, this information, this is Casmel. My sister and I used to have Allison's Creations for Celebrations after I finished teaching. And this is one of the things that we did in our store, the collectibles on, of the village of Webster. Unfortunately, we ordered this twice and we sold out of it because it was so popular. Uh, the Candy Kitchen burned down in 1973 and it opened in 1908 and people are still talking about it. It's amazing. It was a legend. That's why I'm a little annoyed that it wasn't in the book. I didn't know it, but my brother told me it wasn't in there. He, he picked it up. He's, he was the engineer. Never questioned an engineer. You know how that goes. Well, anyway, what I thought I might do, so my, there are people who are here. How many of you ever knew the candy kitchen? See? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And if I, I asked, are there any, any people in here maybe besides Anne who worked in the candy kitchen? Because my father used to employ so many different kids from high school, and they'd come down, they'd, we'd, we'd work during our lunch hour. We'd have we take a, a period off before and a period after. Well, I didn't know exactly what was going to happen today, and I had started on, and Lord, just give me enough years to finish, <laughs> because I keep getting interrupted. I had started on what would be a history of the candy kitchen, but also really a, a, my, I'm my own bio, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I thought this this is a, something I've written in the first chapter of what I was going to have for the candy kitchen. And uh, since it's a little different, I will just start with it. Um, it basically talks about the fact that patriotism was quite the thing in Webster in the early part of the century. Um, the, the candy kitchen was all decked out for the 4th of July. I, I'm not using my book, I'm using, I'm using this instead. I have, I, I have a picture here, and I'll pass it around so you can look at it. This was a Webster candy kitchen. Two people in the, in the front, I've got copies of it, and I'd like them all returned, but you can just pass it around, Lisa, and people can look at it. and. Uh, you'll see that this is the way the village looked in the nice. early days. This is the candy kitchen in the middle. There's only one window over it because that's the way it was. And the stairs were open to go upstairs to our home over the candy kitchen. A lot of people lived over there. In the front are my mother and um, my, her, her cousin, Catherine Stathes. Mom and Catherine came over from Greece together uh, in, what year, Nancy, 19? 1913, I think it was. 1914, it was before the war. And they came, they came to Brooklyn, actually. And they're standing out in front, but the thing to look at is how how in heaven's name they ever decorated the town like that, you know. Uh, but the Webster was all decked out, and I see a car going by. I'm wondering if they were having a parade. Now the interesting thing about this here is, right to the uh, this side here is Paul Smith's General Store. Any of you remember Paul Smith's General Store? Well, if you saw it in 1909 or whatever, it was the same in 1940. 
It was unbelievable. It was between the candy kitchen and Paul Smith's store, and this was the alley. The hill went down and so forth and so on. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then to the left would be the old Webster Hotel, which went all the way to the corner. But this hotel, again, goes way back, and you can see the, the uh, alley going down, and in the back was the big barn where all the pigeons had a roost. You ought to go up there. And, you know, and uh, all along the one side, it was like a square back in there, were the stables where they kept the horses and everything else because they had people who were in the end. Well, anyway, that's exactly the way that that was. Now, um, Catherine's brother was Nick Christou. Of, and he ran the Fairport Candy Kitchen. Now you might be wondering about all these candy kitchens, and they are connected, and I don't, don't know exactly where to put that in. Well, maybe I should just go through with the Webster Candy Kitchen first. I, I'm working with a book, but it's going to all get changed. Um, uh, and uh, that's where my dad met my mother. Uh, she, uh, and, and I can... Catherine's brother, Nick Papadakis. The candy kitchen uh, was opened in 1909. It says on this, most of the things say 1908. Anyway, uh, and, and, and my father was in the candy kitchen before World War I. But he'd been in other places, too. If I got into him, it's a long story. It's a different story. But anyway, he met my mother going over to the Fairport Candy Kitchen because she had come up from Brooklyn, and she had trained to be a, a candy dipper. And what a candy dipper she was. She, in, down in New York City, she worked for a company called Michelle's. You know, the candy dipping is all done by hand back then, and I don't know if you're familiar with chocolates and things, but a candy dipper puts the mark of what's inside the candy, so you don't have to go around and punch them like my husband did to all the things he <laughs> ate to see if he liked it or not first. And so my mother was expert. Everything she ever did was perfection. Not us, but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so she had learned her craft down there, and my father, uh, and she had a lovely personality, and she was very attractive, and my father was smitten, and I probably thought, hmm, uh -huh. I could use her in the back room, <laughs> and so forth and so on. And like I said, the candy kitchen was two, bu two buildings with the open staircase. What a mess that was in the wintertime when the ice formed. We could get in the, into our home above the candy kitchen from the back steps as well. When we moved out of there in 1944, then my father enclosed it. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, we just had to use another entrance. And um, like I said, Paul Smith's general store was to the south, and we. Used to, as kids, we used to go down the alleyway, which went all the way down the hill and around over to North Avenue. And if you got a good run on the hill, you could really go all the way down. And my brother and I both had flexible flyers. My brother, so, was the nth degree. He's a boy, remember? A freak boy. <laughs> and he had one that had chrome handlebars rubber-tipped handles, and so forth and so on. But my brother, being as inventive as he was, since he became an engineer, decided we could do something else. So we had the ice cream maker downstairs, you know, the, the basement. This, this, this candy kitchen was a, a long building, and it, there were three stories, really, to it. The basement, in the basement, of course, it originally was Specs Market, so that already had the uh, refrigeration downstairs. So there was, then, then my father had two freezers down there, walk-in freezers and a walk-in cooler. And so, um, like I said, uh, that's where he used to make, make the ice cream. 
what my brother th thought, um, so you had to have the, the uh, milk cans came from the Chaplain Dairy in the city, <coughs> bringing the ice cream mix that you put in the freezer and so forth and so on. And my dad uh, made ice cream every, every Thursday. Well, Jim thought, gee, well, Chaplain Dairy is not here picking up those cans. What we could do is we could use the ice cream cat covers, the, ca the milk can covers. You know what a milk can mm -hmm. looks like. We put our fanny in one and our feet in the other, and down the hill we would go. And if you could steer with your feet, you could imagine if we had invented that and, and, and patented it because it was really the precursor of the flying saucers. Yeah. Yeah. Only he was way ahead of himself. But anyway, we had a great lot of fun on, on that particular hill. And um, I, in, in the um, album that I have there, I don't have a picture of it, I have across the street, because across the street from the candy kitchen, we got Paul Smith on the one side now, we've got uh, the hotel on the other side. Across, before they, before they filled in that alley, then that alley became Betty LaFaz Beauty Parlor, oh, wow. <laughs> actually. You had, you had the building that was Tausch's building, you had Foley's, you had the bank, the Jane Mason Bank, which we later occupied also as Allison's, uh, and, and had a gift shop there for a while in our crazy years, after I got out of teaching, and everything else. And it was, and I, I did not realize it till I was researching some things, that there were three floors in that building where Lucas Pharmacy was down below, uh, years later, but and then, then it became Tausch's in le years later. But there was a third floor that was the Opera House. I did not know that. Almost every small town, from what I've been reading, had an Opera House, believe it or not, and it was the center of things and so forth and so on. Well, anyway, uh, that, that's what the other part of the thing is. And to the left, of course, was what was known as the Holly Block, because Mr. Holly owned all that block, and there were a, there were stores underneath. Wally's had a, a store, then it became Howard's, and, and Mr. Holly had his hardware store. And on the corner, there was another bank for a while, and later on, it became the Webster Drug Store. Well, behind the Webster Drug Store, uh, we. And another little enterprise that I got into before I went into teaching, my girlfriend was next lived next door to me on uh, back backyards to me uh, over on I was on Curtis she was on Dunning, and uh, next door was my mother's house, and we're watching the parade go by at about 1960. I really don't know the date totally. And all of these brownie troops, you cannot imagine how many brownie troops marching in the Memorial Day Parade. So we decided, hey, you know what? This town needs a children's shop. So that children's, the children's corner was born in the old post office that was behind what was the Webster Drug Store, I think, at that time. But anyway, uh, so that, I'm, I'm sort of going along with the, the development of the candy kitchen. And the trolley ran through Webster. It ran all the way from the Rochester, uh, down by the bay, around, around the, I believe it went down the uh, base, base side of the bay. Yes. Yeah, it came down, and then it went, and then it went by the Empire Boulevard and went all the way to Sotus. And it was very interesting because um, since we didn't have a car till 1937, my mother and her relative down in Williamson, who had the candy kitchen, uh, used to put my brother Jim on the, on the trolley on the weekend, and he'd go down to Williamson to play with his cousin Harry for the weekend, and the next weekend he'd come up. If you could just put the kid on the trolley and he'd get off, and nobody, nobody would, you know, days you wouldn't let a kid walk across the street alone, practically, and so forth. And um, in the early days, the candy kitchen had 
the usual marble top tables mm -hmm. with a wired chairs. There was one, and I don't know why my father didn't keep it. There was a children's size. My Uncle John kept his when he had his candy kitchen. The four little chairs, it was priceless, but we didn't have that. However, um, that later he remodeled in 1940. He didn't save the tabletop, the, the, those things, those nice antiques. He saved all these old light fixtures <laughs> on the wall, which were worthless, actually. But anyway, um, our family, like many, many, many people, lived over our place of business at that time. It was a large apartment. It was um, 1,800 square feet. It was not small. You, and it was very nicely laid out. The living room was in the front, the, um, the dining room was next, and then the kitchen with a, la with a, with a, a laundry room and a, ba a bathroom to the left, a 45-foot hall over which uh, th three bedrooms, and, the sun por and, a, and a porch in the back, and the stairs that went down, and a little powder room and everything else. It was very, very nice. We, we lived there until... 1945, actually. Um, uh, like I said, the Depression must have been very difficult for business. If we were poor, we didn't know it because we always had enough to eat. Although I remember remember eating uh, bread and milk with sugar on it, and I thought that was a real treat. <laughs> but I must have been a junior. <laughs> anyway. Um, well, anyway, there are three things in life, as I, as I say, that are certain, and that's death, taxes, and change. And change finally did come in 1936 and 1937, the highlight of which in 1937 was the birth of my sister Alice, and then the birth of getting a new car. We had a, we had a 1937 Pontiac. It costs six hundred dollars. <laughs> Do you know that that car, my when my brother graduated from, from Rensselaer, he drove that car. Then it went into his 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 in-laws' family. That car had so many miles on it. I cannot tell you how many miles it had on it actually. But also we got all new furniture. It was wonderful. Um, we had gotten the furniture. Mom went to Kittleburgers, which was up in Rochester, I think on Plymouth Avenue. I can't quite remember. So we had a new dining room set, a beautiful feudal oak dining room set. And uh, it's still in use at 20 Dunning Avenue. <laughs> it's still there as good as anything you could ever, ever expect to get. And then, then my dad had a, had a, a, a we, we got a new, new radio. Uh, I think it was a Philco. Yeah, we had a Philco. And it had a console next to the chair, and underneath the underneath the rug, a thick, a thick uh, connection of electricity went to a speaker, and my brother and, I, and he was, my dad could sit there in his chair and change the cha change the thing, and Jimmy and I would sit there in front of the radio listening to all sorts of things. We would listen to things like uh, Orphan Annie with her secret decoder, you know, Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy, uh, Jack Benny, Fibber McGee and Molly, don't open that closet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the radio was really something else because you could be doing something and you could envision this and you used your imagination. Just like you used your imagination in play. You didn't have the toys, you invented things. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we made uh, tanks out of old cartons of, of you know, cardboard, opening them up and then getting in them and going down and going down Sawyer's <laughs> thing down there. I can tell you so much stuff, I don't know where to start with that. But anyway, <laughs> the other new thing that happened since business got better is the candy kitchen was remodeled. And um, it, around 1940, the marble top tables were gone, and I think I've got a picture somewhere here of, of the candy kitchen. And 
Uh, it's, I think you've got one probably in there too. Oh, oh I can read them. No, it's, it's here, but I just get that. Okay. It was remodeled with walnut booths, tile floors, uh, ceiling fans. Let's see. It's a fire. We don't oh. need that. Okay. Okay. Well, this, this really shows it anyway. Um, it was remodeled. So that it's, a, it's, it's what you know today. You can pass that around if you want. <laughs> I thought I had that picture, but I guess I don't. And then um, what we, what Dad really, Dad, my father was absolutely an artist at what he was doing. We had displays. There were, there, were th there were two or three seasons that were very good for candy. Because realize up until uh, our, can our kitchen, candy kitchen was remodeled in the 1940s, all we were serving was sodas, sundaes, candy, no, nothing else. Uh, we had, da I, I don't remember it at all, but Dad said he had a jukebox, not a jukebox, but a forerunner of a jukebox, <coughs> some kind of a machine that had a violin playing and so forth and so on. And then, of course, along came the Wurlitzers, the jukebox, and so forth. They didn't own these. People had these things, and they rented them out to you, but you got to keep a, por a portion of, of the things that went into it. And it was, it was just a wonderful, wonderful time of year. Uh, Dad made ribbon candy. I don't know how many of you are familiar with ribbon candy. Nobody that I know of has made ribbon candy like my father's ribbon candy. And I will pass this picture around. This is not too good, but um, it's a picture of, of the candy. In order to make the ribbon candy, it's a, and I don't know why, we took pictures of our little kids walking and doing all these things, and we didn't have enough sense to take pictures of my father doing the whole process of making that ribbon candy. They would have been priceless to have because it was a long process. There were two large marble slabs in the back room. The, uh, ke the, ke the copper kettle, one of the copper kettles is out there. On the, on the original stove that my father would cook up the, the stuff. The, what, what you had to do with making ribbon candy is it took an hour to make for him to pull 15 pounds of ribbon candy. And the way it works is it's kind of like using taffy. I think the hook is out there as well, right? Yes. Um, anyway. You have this boiling pot of sugar and corn syrup and whatever's in it, and it comes to a boil at a certain temperature, and they put it on the big slab. They've got iron things around the little bars to keep the candy from going up. They're wearing, wearing gloves because it's so hot. They flip that over until it's cool enough for them to put on the hook like this, like a big loop, and then they begin to throw it and throw it, and throw it, and it turns white. But meanwhile, there's some pieces that they make. It's so hard to explain it to you. It's like a loaf of bread when, it, when you're done. And they put the, put the bars of the red color, or whatever, uh, uh, there on the ribbon, and then they, then they begin to pull it in front of a row of gas like this. Did it take more than one person to do it? Oh, well, yes, you need at least two people. Okay. What happened, my dad would be the one that would He'd, he'd put those rubber gloves on, mm -hmm. and he'd stand yeah. in there for hours pulling mm -hmm. the ribbon candy in front of that row of hot flames. Yeah. My mother yeah. used to, to do the ribbon thing by hand first, then we got that little gadget that's over there in the machine. It's, it's just a, looks like a couple of years that were, were, were there. And my job was to line up yeah. the ribbon candy till it cooled, and then they were put in jars like that, and they were, it was sold. 
15 pounds of ribbon candy an hour, wow. labor intensive, and so thin. He was such an artist, I, I, I can't tell you how good he was. And the people would come back, and Frank Bain, the plumber, and so forth, they smell that peppermint, yeah. they smell that wintergreen, and they'd come see what, and lots of times they'd help us. Yeah, they would yeah. put it in line, in line yeah. too. The best one he ever made, I think, was a peanut butter. He somehow or another was able to enclose a peanut butter mixture inside the loaf so that when he pulled that thin rope, it was like a belt, about the size of a belt. When he pulled that, and then he'd take his, his knife and cut it, and through the machine it would go and stuff like that. The peanut butter was inside of the, and it melted in your mouth. Unbelievable. And then, of course, I can there, taste it. there was a, the Easter candy, which is a big, big deal. And uh, this is my dad. I think they have pictures over there, too, with my daughter, Cindy, when she was in high school. And that looks just like him. Uh, he was new, new dad. He was he was a great. <coughs> and um, I I get a kick of looking at the prices up above. <laughs> and so we, I can't tell you how much how much candy <coughs> melted in a kettle, not like that. You had to have the du double boiler type thing. Then we finally did get a, a chocolate melting machine that was done automatically. But they still worked it and filled the molds. We had tons of molds, the biggest one being the big rabbit that you can see that my, my father, this one here, standing by. And send, you can send these pictures around just to show, show you the Easter eggs that he decorated. I mean, his, his skill was, was really unbelievable. Um, you can see the candy, though. I remember the Candy in the jars. Yeah. That's yeah. candy. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was something else. Yeah. But you know what? They even Valentine's Day was a big thing. So we had Valentine's bowls and every uh, molds and so forth. And we filled chocolate ones with chocolate, and we'd have paper ones that we would fill. Jerry Barrett, who was the town and village attorney, every year would come down with his. 10 pound heart that he'd given Hilda and have us fill it with chocolates. It was in tatters practically, but he, he, Jerry had how many kids? 10? I can't remember how many she was to have. He'd be coming down with his, with his, with his, uh, with his chocolate filling. I think, I think, and then my father would make. Um, Peanut clusters, mm -hmm. coconut clusters, sponge candy, brittle, uh, peanut brittle, oh, okay. all kinds of things, you know what I mean. He even made his own um, syrups for, for uh, the Sundays and things like that. He didn't waste anything because if there was something that was left over, like some of the mint, uh, he made hard candies and stuff like that. Oh, he's making fudge, fudge syrup. He throws in the mint candy and spits. <laughs> Gee, Steve, that was good. There was a mint flavor. <laughs> and things like that. He had so much fun doing. We had so much fun. But the one thing that they did, I think they would be sued like crazy, was even for April Fool, they would take. Uh, salad peas or beans and make what would be peanut clusters. Oh. <laughs> oh. Molasses chips, cardboard, oh oh. and for, for full things. Oh. Can you imagine getting sued oh my God. in today's world? Well anyway, that was that was that that was a thing with the, the candy kitchen. And like I said, the candy kitchen was there until the the fire came. Uh, like like I said, um, Making the and and when when the store the, the fire came and it burned down and he made candy canes and so forth and so on uh, the fire occurred on our 25th anniversary. My oh. husband and I had had gotten into our car. It was 
Labor Day weekend. He always said he, we got married September 5th. He always said he got, he got married on Labor Day. I don't know, he got a big laugh out of that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so we just got in the car and, and drove on down to Pennsylvania. I'm digressing. If I digress and I, I bore you, let me know. because. And um, I was teaching at that time. I was back and I was teaching full time. And I had been teaching a course on family and marriage or something like that. And I had seen this place in the Poconos where they have all honeymooners going and so forth. So we're down, we're, we're driving. We didn't know where we were going. And we drive into the Poconos, you know, because it's had vacancy. Uh, I said, well, let's try this one, Chris. You know what I mean? So we went in there. And uh, I'll just read you this. A sign on the resort said vacancy, so we drove in, and our accommodations seemed quite unusual. The bed, bedroom sitting walls were all carpeted. The furniture was geared more to reclining than to sitting. And on the, on the coffee table were two red apples on a doily. Uh, adjacent was a, small, uh, was a room with a small sunken pool. It was about 90-some degrees out. Chris decided to get his swimsuit and ventured outdoors to a large swimming pool. It was too hot for me. I preferred to stay in, uh, indoors uh, and uh, reading in, in air-conditioned comfort, reading my book, which was uh, about the Hindenburg, okay? An omen, no doubt. <laughs> After a while, my husband returned saying, hey, there's nobody at the pool. Later, the dinner bell rang, clanged, and everybody entering the, uh, the, the room, we realized we were the oldest people there. <laughs> <laughs> Unbeknownst to us, we had booked in at a haven for honeymooners. I recall the videotape I had shown my class in Family and Marriage that showed the unusual places uh, at Buck Hills with things such as bathtubs like a champagne glass and stuff like that. Sitting next to us was one of the young couples, the new bride, asked me where we were staying. I said, oh, we're in that lane where our, I told her to describe the lane where our cottage, where our cottage was, and she said, oh, you're at the, in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, flashing through my mind was the significance of the two red apples. <laughs> After a day of relaxation, I felt we should call home to let our family know where we were. There were no phones in the rooms, so we attempted to use a payphone at the main hall. However, it was jam full of coins. No doubt for all the newlyweds could have been calling home to mom and dad to tell them they were okay. Still feeling the need to call home, we went to the office and asked if we could use their phone to call the collect. My daughter Cindy answered the phone, and the first words out of her mouth were, I don't know if I should tell you this. I said, what? I don't know if I should tell you. <laughs> Frustrated, I said, Cindy, for God's sakes, tell me. Her reply was, the candy kitchen burned last night. Aww. Needless to say, our second honeymoon was over. We drove home, stopping off at Ithaca's college to see Tony and tell him the news. It was the biggest fire in town since the bowling alley, the night of our Ike's graduate, uh, night of Ike Eisenhower's election. Uh -huh. We were in the back porch of our apartment upstairs. You could not touch the glass because the fire was so hot. Uh -huh. uh, the, fire, the glass was so hot from the bowling alley fire, which was down quite a ways. Um, needless to say, um, but I, wait a minute, many, many fire, many fire companies responded. Uh, people watched from across the street as the centers of the community burned. I was told my dad was among those spectators. It must have been a dreadful moment to see his business that he had started, destroyed, and, and I, I'm breaking up, I know. Needless to say, our lives changed. The building was grossly underestimated and underinsured because it was a risk factor. 
uh, so it made it real high insurance. So we couldn't swing building a new building. We had plans that we had drawn up for expansion to include the alleyway, which we were going to be doing shortly. Chris and I had bought the business, and there was a mortgage left to be paid. Even the school taxes were due. Fortunately, I had been teaching school for the last decade or so, so we had a steady income. Dad and Chris went through the store, salvaging what they could and painstakingly taping an inventory of what was left. The building had not burned completely. Most of the damage was done by water uh, and smoke. Uh, and the reason for that was um, the firemen did not know that that building had been a flat roof building and a peaked roof was put on top of it. So they hit holes, water poured in, Niagara Falls on the side, so it did no good. Good that they did learn that though because they found out and they started to look at the buildings because the, the one on the corner, which was um, a bris bridal shop now, uh, was old Western Auto and stuff mm -hmm. like that. They had the, just the opposite situation. They had a situation where they put a flat roof on top of a peaked roof, so the firemen do know that now, mm -hmm. so it was an, an important thing. Well, anyway, the back room was spared for the most part. Marble slabs were removed and, w and were stored in the barn of the house we owned at 135 East Main. Later we held a barn sold, sells, selling everything, excluding the chocolate molds. We converted the basement of our home, and I have pictures of that in my thing too, to a candy making product room, using some marble slabs and cupboards from our old back room and installing a chocolate, the, the, the chocolate melting machine. George, uh, George Utz of Utz Bakery had agreed to allow us to sell the, cho the chocolate candy in his, home, in his shop. And so each year from 1974 until Dad's death in 1979, we made chocolate candy, Easter, peanut, peanut clusters, and so forth. Dad, Uncle Nick, Chris, and Tony, uh, who, who uh, would work away. Our house smelled like chocolate, and our family room was filled with boxes of Easter goodies from late November until Easter. It gave Dad something to do and gave us all a little more spending money. It was a huge fire. Fire companies came from all over. The firemen chopped holes in the roof, I told you that, and so forth. Uh, the arson squad investigated and felt the fire had probably started by a youth who casually stuck a, a cigarette in, the, in, a, in a, a, a wire that was coming on the sides of, as you walked up the, up the hill. And I don't think it was intentional, but it smoldered in the uh, uh, insulation because it was asphalt to, on top of uh, and, and went up and started in the back booth on the lower level of a candy kitchen. Uh, this is the ending of my first chapter in my book. Many people lamented the loss of the well-known social gathering place of the community. The best comment I recall was made by the village attorney, Jerry Barrett. Too bad there wasn't a good strong west wind to wipe out those old buildings and we could have applied for urban renewal. <laughs> <laughs> One can't help but wonder what the village would have become had the West wind blown. Yeah. As it happened, the building had to be demolished because it was unsafe. Chris and I sold sold it to Dr. Michael Gallia, whose building replaced the old candy kitchen at 14 East Main. Whenever I sat in the dentist chair in the front room, I'd close my eyes and think, I'm back in the time spending spent in my living room of our family apartment, which later became my husband's apartment and mine from 1950 to 57. Buildings may be destroyed, but memories never can. They are with us forever. Very nice. Now, um, do you have any questions before I tell you how all these crazy candy kitchens began? Has it ever occurred to you, what, why is there a candy kitchen here, and why is there a candy kitchen there? Williamson. And so forth and so on. Yeah, yeah Williamson, there's one, right? Yeah, yeah. Fairport. 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 Yeah. And, you know, the funny part is, you've got all these Greek immigrants 
who came over, and if you could see where they came from, they didn't have candy like this, but yet they got into candy making all over. Really? And a lot of Greeks settled in Hershey, Pennsylvania, that area down, down there, and of course you know where you were there. Well, this is the story of the Webster Candy Kitchens and many others, and it's an immigrant story that is really... I, I'd like to share it with you I don't, if I don't bore you to tears. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, because you can go all over the country and you'll find these sweet shops and they all, if you walked into one, they looked like the other one. They all were the same, like the way, you know, with the, the chairs, the, 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 the marble top tables. Well, a cousin of my father's, Jake Papineau, he spelt his, his name with two PAs. We always spelt ours with three and dropped, it to, dropped the one in conversation. Um, I didn't know until it was a, a funeral of, his, of his, uh, one of his uh, sons' wives. I didn't know that my uncle, we called him uncle. You call everybody uncle even though they're cousins. You know how that's out of respect. <laughs> and. Um, he came, I did not know he was a stowaway, as a boy, as a young boy uh, from Greece, he came, he came over into New York, and when he got off of the ships on the pier, he saw these horses all drawing fruit and stuff like that, and some of it would fall down. So he was just a young boy, and he picked, picked up some of the fruit, and he went out on the street and started to sell it. <laughs> and then he realized there was a market. So he wound up having a push cart. And he was selling, selling making, making a buck, you might say. And then, for some reason, he came up to the Rochester area. And then he started the candy kitchens. Whether he did his first or not, I'm not sure. If you go to Palmyra today, and you look at the south side of Main Street, you'll see a building there that says J. Papanu, P-A-P-A-N-U. That was his place, okay? He also had a place in Canandaigua, because I've learned, oh, if I tell you my father's story, it's another story, but anyway, he, he had a place in Canandaigua because I, because my father worked for him for a little a while when he was a little 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 boy. Dad was only 12 years old when he came over, all by himself with, with a, oh a cousin, and that's another story. But anyway, <laughs> so Uncle Jake uh, began to call. Uh, relatives and stuff like that, and began to open all of these different stores. Oh. If you ever heard the, um, if this would, I, I, it would make a wonderful story. <laughs> have you ever heard the song "Yes, we have you hate we have no bananas"? Yeah. 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 Okay, that was written I think around the 1920s, which was when all these things were there. It's, wow. It goes something like, uh, and I can remember at Walter Schrader's mm -hmm. <coughs> house. Mm -hmm. Playing the, the the piano, the player piano, and 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 the words going along, and that that story, I'd, I'd love to be able to write a book and have all the candy kitchens and all over the that you know, and have them put their stories in. Anyway, it goes something like, there's a fruit store down our street, and it's run by a Greek, and he sells good things to eat, but you should hear him speak. When you ask him any, anything, he never answers no. He just yeses you to death, and as he takes your dough, he tells you, yes, we have no bananas. We have no bananas today. We have onions and string beans and so forth, asparagus, but all kinds of fruits, and say, we have an old-fashioned tomato, Long Island potato. Uh, I can't think of the next line. Anyway, but yes. We have no bananas. We have no bananas today. Business got so good with him, he wrote home to say, send me Nick and Pete and Jim. I need help right away. <laughs> when they got there in the store, there was fun, you bet. Someone asked for asparagus, and then the whole quartet chimed in with, yes, we have no bananas. Now, that is really what happened with Uncle Jake. 
send me this one, send me that one. And Webster Candy Kitchen was started by Uncle Jake bringing Charlie Papanu, Papa Panu, I should say, which would be my father's half brother because his 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 mother his uh, Charlie's mother died and and my father's father remarried. That was the, okay. So Charlie came and he was living over the candy kitchen, and then along came also Uncle Harry, right? Now, that's a cousin. I don't know who's good. What, Nancy? It's cousin. Cousin. Yeah, okay. So they were in the Webster Candy Kitchen for a while, okay? Charlie <coughs> wound up dying in the, in the uh, flu the, uh, the, in around 1919 or something like that. Well, anyway, uh, Dad uh, went to Sodas and opened a candy kitchen. And he was in that era when no one would give him a place to stay. Wow. And in the town of Sodas. But uh, you, can't, you can't not love my father. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he slept in the back room of the shop yeah. until, listen to this one, until he got a place to stay offered to him by Ward Tinklepaw's family. Oh, and Ward Tinklepaw, of course, was the undertaker, <laughs> just <laughs> here. And so he stayed, he, and when he left, he, he, led, he left because he went into the service, into World War I. The town of Sodas gave him a gold ring with his name inside of it. Wow. So, Everybody loves Steve. <laughs> but anyway, that's, 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 that's how. But Dad, um, and Uncle Harry was working with Dad after the war, around 1920, something like that. Uh, and he, he was going with a farmer who was taking peaches to Syracuse, riding on the running board of the truck, on Camilla's Hill, it rolled over, oh, no. and he, Harry was killed. And he was very handsome. He had blonde hair and blue eyes for a Greek. That's handsome. <laughs> but anyway, you know, and it's just it's, it's just amazing how all these things. Are. My brother found the newspaper clipping of Harry's death uh, on, on the internet one day. So that that's that's how um, Dad left Soda He didn't go, he, because. Webster, by that time, you know, was a, a nice incorporated village. Webster always, had, when they incorporated in the 05, they had sewage and stuff like that. And the soda, the soda store was more profitable, let's put it that way. However, he had the problem of with the brine and everything keeping the uh, ice cream cold, that he had, would have to pump all of that out. So they gave up the, the store, and he stayed there, and then he married my mother, and that's the rest of that story. But that, that thing with Uncle J Uncle Jake, is, I always think about that. Yes, yes we have no bananas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, he didn't, I don't think he even went through school mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, do you mind me tell you a story that I think is terrific? Yes. Mm -hmm. This is a story, <laughs> because Uncle Jake didn't read or write. Um, and I was watching them, uh, immediately I thought of Uncle Jay, I was well, watching something on television about an Episcopalian minister who had a sexton, and, 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 and a new minister comes along, and he finds out that the sexton can't read. And he, so he says, I'm awfully sorry, he says, but I really need someone who can read and write and so forth, and so he lost his job. So he went out on the street and started selling cigars. Well, he was doing so well, he opened up a cigar store, which thrived. And it was so well done. Another cigar store. And one day he's in the bank, uh, and uh, he's getting something done with the, with the banker. 
and he signs his check with the X, and he says, you know, the banker says to him, I've often wondered what you would have become if you knew how to read and write. Right. Mm -hmm. He says, yes, I would have been a sexton at church. I'm done. Any questions? Child or a candy maker, did you get to sample a lot? Oh yes, <laughs> I love chocolate. I I always like milk chocolate. Mm -hmm. You know that's that's an interesting thing too because there's such a difference between my brother who was three and a half years older than myself. Jimmy was very serious. You know what I mean? And uh, I was <laughs> just the opposite. And. And so there were things that were my favorites. My favorite, I don't know if you ever had the coconut clusters. Oh, those are good. Yeah, and um, um, things like that, peanut you know, clusters. Well, you know, I would go in, into my Hi. store and I would take candy bars and give them to my friends. And Jim, Jim, uh, kid asks hey, Jim, but he says, oh no, my father has to pay for those things. <laughs> and the other thing that was different about the two of us, too, is we all worked in the candy kitchen. Mm -hmm. And, of course, in those days, until my husband came along, we didn't get paid. We worked. It was part of the family business. So guess what? I was in school. Harvey can attest to this. I belonged to every club that there was. <laughs> I stayed with after school for every single sport, and my dear father, and my, my brother would come home with his saxophone in one and his briefcase in the other, and he'd come right to, to work at 3 o'clock, you know, after school was up. I would be controlling in at 5 o'clock because I had a soccer game or this, that, and the other thing. And my father just looked at me and he said, don't they have a janitor to close that school? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yes, we sampled it. But the best thing was the ice cream. My dad made ice cream every Thursday. I swear to God, half of Webster would always take a walk down the alley. Let's go see Steve making ice cream. And my father would give them ice cream. He gave away more than... And taking a... a delicatessen round thing that goes on top of the five gallon thing of ice cream when it's filled, you know, and, he, and then put it on the lid of a, of a of one of those and people would sit there. It's like, it was like frozen custard. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. The other thing he made that some of you may remember uh, were ice cream suckers. No, they, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. they were to die for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what he would do, he would take a half gallon of ice cream and he would cut it into 12 things, stick, stick tongue depressors in, cut, cut, it, cut it, and then the, dip it into the chocolate. Oh. And it was a thick coat yes. oh, and everything nice. else. Mm -hmm. And my daughter Cindy, her job was to run the, th one of the things once they, once they came off the paper that they were put on, to run them down to the freezer before they <laughs> melted, the people would come in and buy those. We did make those even at home, uh, and my friends and daughters of Penelope and the organization I had, we had a picnic at our house, uh, and they, they went crazy over those things. But, and my mother, even though the candy kitchen was gone, she would sometimes dip chocolate-covered almonds, mm -hmm. just oh, yeah. as perfect yeah. as can be. Unbelievable. Nice memories. Do you have any other questions? I hope I haven't bored you to talk. Yeah, really interesting. Yes. Where did he learn his trade, though? How to make ice cream? The candy. You know, did they? Self well, I mean, was it self-taught or something? That no. If one knew, they all knew. They oh. learned from each, other. <laughs> from each other. And my father was so generous that he took all of his candy molds, and that, that one rabbit stood about this high. It was one, only one of its kind, like. And back in those days, it cost three hundred dollars. Oh my and You can imagine wow. how. And, but he lent his. I don't know if he ever was paid anything, but. All these other candy kitchens, and these, most of them around here were from the village of Nyata in Greece. My mom and dad didn't know each other at all over there. They were four miles apart. 
and uh, they met here, like I said, in, in Fairport. And and uh, he would lend his molds to everybody. Mm -hmm. wow. It was they helped each other, you know. Yeah. Why, Mary? Why were they from the one area in Greece? Do you because know? They were, they were Did something happen? Uh -huh. No. No. That no, made them no, leave. No, oh no. And my uncle did not come over until 19, the 1930s. We always had someone living with us who helped <laughs> yeah. downstairs, too. Uh, but it was, it, it, was, it was a different era. Yeah. And one that will never be back. And I, oral history, is, at least you'll know about it. <laughs> it was a lot of, a lot of fun. Any other questions? Because there are a lot of family businesses. You know. Hey, you can't think of anything else that might be of interest to you. But. And we had so many young people that worked in the candy kitchen. I can't tell you. I think every one of the Wilmos girls, but two. Alice Wilmos was with us for 19 years. In fact, my mother named my sister Alice after Alice. Uh, you know, she called her a leaky in Greek. <laughs> yeah. That's cute. Thank you so much. I could only remember, I went to the Grange Hall thing, and I, I, I walked in there and I thought, oh my God, there's where we saw the minstrel show and oh, all yeah. these other things that yeah. people will never will know. And, you know, when, when we're gone, they're gone. Someone once told me there are buried treasures in the, in the cemetery. The people that were buried with their stories. Well, I have a wonderful family. Mary, one of the things we're doing is having cemetery tours. And uh, you're selling what? Cemetery. We're having cemetery tours. Oh, really? And we did. We did the one on the rural rural cemetery, right? And then the Union Cemetery, right? And now we're going to do West Webster. But you realize once you start doing that, there's another way of learning history. Yes. Well, well, let me tell right you right something. It's, yeah. Yes, and if you go through Webster, you'll see a lot of Papapanos and some with PAPA. -A. Yeah. <laughs> They're all buried practically in, in the Webster cemeteries. Yeah. You know, we got, we got involved with the Zoots family. Do you know the Zoots? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Vending machines. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, he, he was from Yata, too. And my father even worked for him part-time. And I, I, you've got to get going because you had your lunch and everything. But that that's... Someday I should just give you the story of my father's life because it's really something else. Yeah, they ended up of an immigrant, you know. But he was what a man. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I used to date. Yeah. Is it clear? Because I can get another one.